So welcome back to the shop friends. Today we're going to be discussing the 10 things you're doing wrong when changing your motor oil. You may not be doing breaking all 10, but chances are you're probably missing a couple of them. Number one, cheap oil. Did you know not all oil is created equal? Look at it like hamburger. You can go to the grocery store and you can buy cheap hamburger in a tube. And indeed it is hamburger. Or you can go and you can buy ground round. Both are considered hamburger, both are not the same. Same thing with oil. So there's cheap oil, the stuff that you're gonna get on sale, uh, and there's going to be premium oils that you're gonna pay more money for. When I consider premium oils, I'm looking at like Lucas or Am's oil. There is a difference. I know there's a difference. It's hard to justify, you know, and there's all guys arguing on the internet and I ran Lucas oil and I got so many miles and I ran Rotel and I got so many different miles. The truth is in the analyzing and the testing. So let me give you a couple examples that I have. So I used to work for a company that had a tremendous amount of heavy equipment, tons and tons, thousands, millions of dollars worth of equipment. And I was intimate with the service guys and what they would do is that on this equipment, they would send oil and now out for analysis. And so what that means is they would send it to a lab uh, and the lab would break it down and they could kind of uh, get in front of any serious maintenance issues. So if a bearing was going or if a hydraulic pump or something like that was starting to let go and just discharge uh, parts or, or little pieces of it, they could say, hey, this is going to grenade the whole engine. You might want to take a look at this. What they found was when they started sending, I'm not gonna name, name brands, but if you run a diesel engine, I guarantee you this is probably the oil that most people are running. Uh, what they found was after 200 hours, that was a service interval, that this, these oils were so deteriorated so bad that they couldn't even determine what their viscosity was. They switched over to Lucas, and they were able not only to tell what the viscosity was, but they were to extend this service, even double it. And some of the guys there even thought that they would be safe to triple it. So instead of 200 hours and the oil is completely broken down and wasted, the Lucas with the additive was going 400 and even 600. Second thing, AMS oil, and this is, I, I have nothing to do with any one of these companies. Uh, I pay full price just like you guys do. AMS oil, the guy that built my dirt bike, He's one of the best dirt bike builders probably in the country, at least certainly on, on the West Coast. He does a lot of engine, heavy engine repairs. He recommends AMS oil, and he showed me in his shop, if you run this oil that most people are running, again, not going to name, name brands, this is what you can expect after at, when, you, when you're replacing a piston in a two-stroke engine. And he pulled the head off of it, and it was just caked with black goo and carbon and all this stuff. He said, look at this, same engine, same hours, running the AMS oil, two stroke oil, clean, nothing on it. So you can't tell me that there's no difference. So I choose to go with Lucas, Lucas or AMS oil. The only reason I don't go with AMS oil is because I just don't have a local dealer and you can't buy it off the shelf. So I can get this on Amazon uh, and I run the full synthetic and uh, on my van, whatever your vehicle's called for. Number two, additive. You should be running an additive. What an additive is, additive is going to do is in the Lucas, as far as that goes, is that it is a thicker oil that clings to the valve train, to the gear train, to everything inside the engine. And what it does is it offers you protection on a cold start. It's legitimate, it's, it's real. It's a little bit expensive. I mean, you're looking at you know, 16, $17 for this, but this will last you for two oil changes. Now, let me with a caveat. So if you're talking about brand new engines, like the engine in my van is a 3.5 liter EcoBoost. It's a high performance engine. Twin turbos is basically the same engine and the GT40 are the same block, you know, that where they start from. And so it runs a full synthetic of 530. Now, if you have these engines that are very high performance with a certain valve train and, and they have tight, tight tolerances, that what they're gonna recommend on this, Lucas, and I called them yesterday to verify this, is a 10 to one instead of a 21. So if you read the bottle, it's gonna say, if your vehicle takes five quarts of oil, replace one of those quarts with this right here, make this the fifth. Now, if they're brand new, don't cut that in half, half a quart. So if it's four and a half quarts of oil, half a quart of additive. When the engine starts to break in a little bit and it gets you know, maybe a little bit higher tolerances and, and worn in a little bit, maybe then you can do it, but you can run into some problems and throw some engine lights with that. So the additive is really important in protecting those startups. It really, really makes a difference. And a quick side note, stick with high quality parts, filters and such. I, 
I'm a Ford guy. I run Fords. My granddad was a Ford mechanic from 1946 until he retired. Um, we're just a Ford family. Motorcraft. That's a fact. That's the original OEM parts. You know, there you pay what a dollar two, two dollars more for an oil filter, but you have the peace of mind. So I only run good quality parts. You may not know this, but all auto parts are not created equal. There are about well, it's arguable, but about five tiers of quality. Some parts stores carry the bottom of the barrel junk, and then usually towards the higher end, you're going to look at the OEM or the dealer parts. So sometimes it's just not in the budget, but when you can, when you're talking about filters, go with, go with the factory spec, man. Go with the good stuff. Here's a tip that will make your life a lot easier. What I do on the inside of the, the, inside of the hood here on the engine compartment, I write uh, all the information I need for the oil change. So I write uh, how many quarts, so 5.9 quarts of 530. I write the, um, the part number for the oil filter, the 5000S there, the air filter part number, and the plug for the drain. That way I can quickly look at that. I know how much oil I need. I know I can double check that I have the right filters and such. And when I crawl under there, I've got the right wrench. I don't have to come back out to grab the, the one that I didn't get. Number three, use a clean pan when you drain your oil into it so you can kind of see what's going on. You run your car to Jiffy Lube and they've got the big, you know, the receptacle deal and you've got uh, a bearing that's coming apart or you've got some gasket material, you've got something in the oil. Do you think that they're going to see it? think that anyone's going to know what's going on at all? If your car's under warranty and there's something happening and you got a bunch of metal shavings in it, you want to know about that, right? Before it goes out of warranty. So have a clean pan and that way when your oil goes in there, you know, you can turn it really quickly and just do a quick inspection. I mean, it's not scientific, but you can see if there's going to be something majorly wrong. Time to go under, get oily. You gotta check out this creeper. This is a creeper. Uh, I think they still call them creepers. This belonged to my granddad. Granddad, uh, as I said, was a mechanic his whole life. When he worked, he worked for the Ford dealership. This was way before they had the fancy lifts and all that. Guys were underneath the cars. I'll bet, I don't know for sure, but I'll bet he bought this thing in, it, it had to be been the 40s or 50s. <laughs> it's, it's so old, you know, things are so different now, but I, I love having these old things around from him. Uh, because it's such a memory of uh, when I used to work in his shop. But look at this. You know, just show the difference between that, uh, that generation and ours. You know, where this, he had broken this. You know, something happened and he'd, he'd, he's brazed that, welded that with brass. And, and my Nana, you know, has had reupholstered how many times, who knows, you know, the little head pillow that he used, you know, he'd have his head on. And I remember her doing that. And, and uh, look at this. The, it's just been ran so much that the, the old wheels are even, you know, falling apart, but it's still going. And I can just see all, you know, his initials and all the repairs. And it's, it's cool, to, cool to have those things. Kind of an interesting side note is I've purchased two creepers, uh, you know, newer ones that are long since gone. You know, the wheels failed and they bent. And they just weren't the quality, but I still have granddad's whole, cre <laughs> whole creeper. <laughs> all right, let's go under now, before you drain your oil, make sure you make sure the engine's warm. You know, you don't have to drive it around, but just start it up and bring it up to temperature. And it's going to, uh, the oil's going to be a little thinner. It's going to mix up with anything that's in there and all come out at one time. Get your pan under there. I quit using the stupid treble light so long ago, you know, with the cord and all of that. And then you're down here with your creeper roll and you can't roll over it. These little right angle LED lights with the magnets on them. This is an Olight. The magnets are so strong uh, that it's just... That's all I use anymore. They're so much superior. While that's draining out, we'll get the filter out. That, my favorite filter wrenches are these, the strap type uh, that you just wrap around themselves. They're, uh, they're, they're pretty handy. You can fit a wide range of filters. You know, when you have those metal ones, you have to have all those different sizes and inevitably, you know, you get down there and you got the wrong size. And, and so you, this will pretty much wrap down everything. What number were we on? Man, I even wrote myself a list right here. Whatever. <laughs> I think we jumped ahead. All right. So, uh, here, this is, uh, let's say, we'll call this crush plug. Number number four, uh, some of these oil pan plugs are going to have a crush washer on them. You'll look at it as copper, and that's meant to be changed every time it's, it crushes and makes that seal. Can you get away without doing it? Yeah, of course you can. But if you just get kind of get it in your mind, put that on your list when you're getting your stuff, you know, it's a dollar, 75 cents, doesn't cost much, replace that crush washer. The nice engineers at Ford, the only company that didn't take the bailout, I might add, uh, included, it has a rubber, a heavy rubber uh, gasket on there. I don't know if they're specking out replacing the plug. I couldn't find it in the manual, but it looks really high quality. So I'm not going to worry about that there. The other thing you can do, it, what you should do, take your keys out, man. Take your keys out. When you take that oil plug off, you know, clean it all off, off, inspect it, replace the washer, put it with your keys. 
It's easy to forget about things and you can get distracted and jump in your vehicle in an emergency, who knows what happened, and, it, and you've drained the oil out. And it, I mean, it can happen. It's happened to a friend of mine, so don't tell me it can't. Put it right there, that way you'll know and you can't get it wrong. So the other thing, number, what was my number here? Number, <laughs> number three, we're going back to number three. I fill the oil filter with oil. And what I'll do is I'll take my pan and set it up here and just quickly glance at that and just to make sure that they're the same, you know, it, that there's no major difference. I mean, I'm not putting a micrometer on it or anything, but, you know, a quick glance. Okay, I do have the right filter. They didn't box it improperly and fill it with oil. Fill it with oil. That was, uh, that's number three on my list right here. Remember, when you're pouring your oil, I don't know why it took me so long to figure this out, you don't pour it this way seems like you should, you pour it this way with the thing on the top and then you don't get the glug, the glug, glug in the spill. So yeah, if you have a filter that's going in horizontally, you're not gonna be able to do this, but if you have a, a, a filter that goes in up and down vertically, then you can, you know, just keep, you know, fill that up there and don't, you don't want to like heaping out, but you can see that the air is coming out of there and, and we have other things to do on our list while that oil is draining and while this thing is settling right there. We'll just keep that there and just keep adding to it. While our oil is draining, we want, you wanna rotate your tires. Now, this is often overlooked. So if you don't know on your tires, uh, because the front tires are turning, they wear, they wear kind of in a shape like this. You can look at them. You can look at a truck that has been, the tires haven't been rotated properly. It's all rounded and it wears your tires out actually really quickly. So you rotate them. It's, you're supposed to rate, rotate them every 10,000 miles or so. And the worst thing that happens is, you know, you buy tires from like Les Schwab or America's Tire, and you know, it comes with a free rotation. And you just don't get around to doing it because you have to make an appointment. I mean, it takes hours and it's just, you just, it doesn't happen. So just get in the habit, get, change your oil, rotate your tires. And, and that way, you know, it's done. When you rotate your tires, remember it's a crisscross pattern. So the right front goes to the left rear. The left front goes to the right rear. If they crisscross that way. And here's another pro tip. So on big tires, you can really hurt your back. And I, I see people really struggling with this all the time on trying to get these wheels off and on up onto the, up onto the, the studs. Simple trick is, is come down here. And if you don't have a lift, you put your knee down there like that and gently roll the tire up on your leg. Use your leg, use your leg to move it up and down and then off like this here. I mean, you've got to rotate your tires, man. I mean, they're so expensive. It's just incredible how expensive everything is. It's like, you know, you, gas goes, get, tires are made out of oil. And they kind of, they're, as a commodity, you know, could, they kind of fluctuate up and down with the price. And what I've noticed with tires is, you know, gas will like, go, oil will go up, certain amount of barrel, then it'll go down. The tires never go down. It's like it keeps hitting this benchmark going up, up, and up. Like when you're talking about nice, heavy, load range E truck tires, like, you know, these KO2s here, they're $300 a tire. So if you can get an extra 10,000 miles out of them by good, ro uh, good rotation, uh, then it's definitely well worth it. Here's a shop tip for you. So if you use like me, these blue shop towels, right? Uh, come in a roll and you, you know, so you use one and you wipe some grease off of something and you know, you usually just throw it in the trash can, right? Well, what I've started doing is I've just kept a box below my vice here where I spend most of my time working. So the ones that I've used to clean up stuff or have a chemical or something on them, they can still be used again. So rather than th just throw them away, I keep them in this towel and they're perfect for when you have, well, like is my custom spilling oil all over the ground as I always do uh, for situations like this. <laughs> so you don't have to waste a bunch of uh, brand new clean ones. You can kind of throw those old grum grummy ones that would have just been in the landfill uh, and soak up your messes there. Rotating the tires takes about 15 minutes or so and that gives time for the oil to all drain out of the engine. Uh, make sure that we're, our filter is full. Um, and here's the trick. What you want to do is to dip your finger in there. Don't use gr dirty, greasy paws with gravel and stuff on them, but clean hands and coat that uh, rubber seal on there. And that will keep it from galling. It'll help it to seal. Just take a little bit of that new oil and coat that on there. And then we'll take these under and put them in. This is important here. I had to bring the camera off the mothership. Do not, I repeat, do not over tighten your oil filter. It should be hand tightened. Now it's going to be, 
you know, it's going to be oily and slippery, right? So you can't really get a very good grip on it when it's oily and slippery. So what you want is once it comes up tight on the threads, clean it off, um, and then as tight as you can get it with, with one hand. If you're a, a weak soy boy, you might want to use two hands, but if you're a normal person, you can use one hand, and that should be tight enough. You over-tighten that thing, it heats up, it gets tighter, and if you... If you have trouble getting these off, what you can do, I've done in the past, is you can drive a screwdriver or a punch through them, um, but it's usually a tight area and you can chisel them off. Sometimes that will tear the canister off, then you have to, well, we won't get into that, but it's, it gets bad, so don't over tighten. With our filter and drain plugged in, let's go ahead and add our oil. Now we're gonna make sure that we add our additive last. Now don't take your fill cap and sit it right there, right? What's gonna happen? Nine times. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to drive off and leave it. A lot of guys do. So put it on the workbench so that you'll see it and like, oh, I got to put that back on. Also, do yourself a favor uh, and get one of these little, uh, these little funnels. These are uh, a dollar or two and they're so nice. And remember, when you're pouring your oil, you pour it, pour it with the spout up. Now we're going to, this requires 5.9 quarts. So it's essentially six quarts. Um, and we're going to put all the oil in first and the additive last. Don't throw these in the trash just yet. We're going to need these. I'll show you. That's going to be number 10. Funny story. Granddad, of course, I told you I lived through the Depression. And the Depression, uh, the folks that I have met that lived through Depression that, or had, uh, had a profound impact on them. He was, he was very thrifty. Um, one th thing I remember him doing was that he'd change, of course, he was a mechanic, so he would change all his own oil. And there's always a little bit of residual in there, right? So he'd built a little deal uh, with a little coffee can. And when he was done with these, uh, he would take them and let them drain um, upside down for 24 hours. And after, I don't know how long it took, but it, after many, many years, I think of oil changes, he would end up with a free quart. <laughs> so I'll, I'll never forget that. I, when I think back on it now, I think, I don't know if your granddad was doing himself any favors, you know, is that sitting there 24 hours draining in there? How much dirt and grime and stuff is getting in that oil than going into the engine? Like, I, I don't know. That, that's just what he did. Start your engine. You got your keys and your oil plug wasn't right next to it, reminding you that it is indeed where it belongs. I know it sounds dumb, but those things happen. Let it run for a minute or two. That'll circulate everything. Make sure that the oil filter and all that is full and just double check on the dipstick. Some new cars don't have dipsticks any, any longer. So it's really important to measure the amount of oil. You're kind of reliant upon the information center and the computer to tell you. I don't really need these reading glasses. I just wear them because they make me look smart. Number seven, of course, change that air filter. Now, of course, we're changing our oil, what, every 10,000 miles now. We live in the country, drive on a lot of gravel roads, a lot of dust, so that might be a little bit more than you need. If you live in an area that's super clean, um, probably not. But, I mean, it's peace of mind. 10,000, what are you ch changing it? You know, one and a half times a year uh, for the increased fuel economy you're going to get, the peace of mind, um, and go with your factory for, get your factory good, high-quality filters. That's... Uh, it just they don't cost that much more and they're just they're just better there's probably more than a few of you that are saying nope i've checked all these boxes off i do all those things every time i service my car i'm going to get you on number nine grease your door hinges now according to the manufacturer they say do it twice annually twice a year and you hear them all the time squeaking creaking doors especially live in areas that put chemicals on the doors what i found to work the best what i, I use for all squeaky doors and type of things is this dupont non-stick it's a dry film lubricant yeah you can put penetrating oil and all that stuff in there and and then it drips down it just makes a mess this stuff's really nice i use it a lot on dirt bikes and motorcycles it um it goes on it's clear it's dry it lubricates it bonds to the metal it's really good and some of the newer door hinges have i don't know what it is it's some sort of a if it's a plastic or it's a different compound it's not metallic inside there and i don't know how that reacts to oil so take your door hinges and just give these a little squirt Top and bottom, little bit, and that'll do it. Another thing you can do, this is, will really help and make your keys last a lot longer, is give a little squirt in your door locks. Now don't go spraying oil and stuff in there. This is good, just a little bit. This is good because it dries and it's not going to collect dust and dirt. Uh, it's very similar to like the, the dried chain lubes that we use, but just a little bit in there and that will make the keys work a lot better and, and prevent your keys from wearing out. Now that you're off the jack stands and the, you're on the ground, 
that's when you tighten. Tighten with, the, I mean, it's best to use a torque wrench. I don't have a half inch drive torque wrench, so uh, I just use a flex handle. Uh, tighten those guys up that way. When you're on the jack stands, if you try to tighten it, then it, you know, you have to have someone to hold the brake and it goes around and around, so just do it like that. And no, I'm not going to put aftermarket wheels on there. I get, I get, I get so much, every time I show the van, I get so much grief. Like you need to get those horrible steel wheels off there and put some aftermarket ones. No, I don't. I, I like the, I like the factory look. I like the kind of the government, uh, <laughs> the government look to it. You know, I mean, go ahead. If you want to spend your money on wheels, that's fine. I mean, I, I get it, the whole thing. I'd rather spend my money on, see, when I was, a, when I was young and a fool, I was all about all show and no go. And then after, I don't know, maybe it was mid 40s or so, I start, you just start to get a clue in life. Then you go for go and less show. So go for me is good tires, four wheel drive, Bilstein suspension, things that actually matter, things that actually improve your driving and your capabilities. Aftermarket alloy wheels make no difference at all. Just, it's just, uh, it's just, appeals to look so that's uh i'm not putting different wheels on before you shut the hood quick glance on the fuels washer fluid power steering fluid automatic transmission fluid brake fluid all those type of things you should on newer cars you should be able to just have a glance you can see the levels and remember when you're tra testing your automatic transmission fluid a lot of cars i think majority of cars you need to check it while it's running so the pump is running so once you've done that you can close the hood and number 10, and the hardest part for me, is put your stuff away when you're done. That's why our shops uh, uh, get so messy. You, you ever wonder why it's like you spend a whole weekend getting, you know, getting everything organized and then a month or two later it's a disaster back the way it is again? It's because we don't put things away when we're done with the projects. It's easy to look at a project and say, well, I just finished the oil change and I'm done. You're not done. You're not done until everything's put away. So what I do is I uh, save the oil containers, put them in your vise like that, and turn the the little fill area towards you so you can see how much is in there so you don't overfill and make a mess. Put the oil back in these guys, and there's better oil pens than I have right here. They're easier to drain. Uh, put the lid on there and put them back into the box. Clean them all up, have them nice and clean because uh, like for me in my area, my local parts store, they, uh, they'll take used more oil for free. There's guys that use it and burners and different things and are glad to have it. So. Uh, so yeah, just put it back in the case that it came in, seal it up, and then next time you, you go into town, throw that in your truck, and then uh, give it to those guys, and they'll take care of it. Take your oil filter, take one of your old used up rags, put it in the bottom of the box. It's gonna drip a little bit, put that in there like that. You can throw that away, your air filter. There you go, piece of cake. And finally, is this number 10, number 10? No, this is a bonus, this video goes to 11. How lucky are you guys? All right, uh, so you're, you're gonna have your, your owner's manual. Take a moment and in the back or insert some pages or something and write down what you did in the mileages. You know, I know it's easy to remember, but there's a reason why I do this. And it's not necessarily for me, it, but it's for the next guy. And what I mean by that is that you're not gonna have this car forever. It's eventually gonna end up in the, in the hands of another guy. And of course, we try to live our, our life by the golden rule. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How nice would it be uh, I mean, if you were, uh, if you were uh, uh, starting a young family and, and you didn't have a ton of money and you need to get some transportation for your, vehicle, for your family? I mean, the used car business is seedy. And it's how do you know? I mean, how do you know what's going on? And I mean, you could save for a year to buy something and have the transmission conk out on you because of someone, you know, wasn't up front or honest with you. So the reason why I keep these records like this, how nice would it be if you find yourself in that situation and the guy hands over, look, here's the book. Uh, here's what I've done. I've kept up on the maintenance. I would not not give you a peace of mind and help you to make a good decision. I, I, do, I, I think it's important, you know, the, the more that I, the closer I get to God and the more he impresses upon things to me, these things that we've been given and, and to be able to be so blessed to be able to, drive, to buy a brand new vehicle, um, don't take them for granted. Um, you are a caretaker of these things and we only receive these things because of God's mercy. It's so funny that the, the, I mean, the irony of folks that are so vehemently opposed to Christianity and opposed to God are the very ones that are benefit uh, from his long-suffering patience and kindness. It's his very breath of life that keeps, keeps them going um, and allows them uh, to curse him to his face. So remember in all things that we're doing, so just do the best you can with your tools, you know, take care of them. And, and, and how, I'll close with this. How would you feel 
We've, we've covered this many times. How would you feel if you gave um, your neighbor something, um, if you sacrificed, you bought him a brand new lawnmower, um, and then you look out and he, he doesn't wash it and he leaves it outside in the rain, he doesn't sharpen the blade and he doesn't change the oil. How would you feel about that? How, that, how, would you feel that he was grateful? Did, would you feel that he was showing gratitude? Not that he owes you anything, um, but the fact that, I guess the point that I want to make is that when we don't look after our things and we don't do the best that we can with them, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's offensive to God. Um, and I think it shows great disrespect, um, just seems to me. So thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the next video.